All right. So um, again, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, back to Optimizing Vision in Diabetes with Dr. Wu. Uh, Dr. Wu graduated with honours from the University of Western Australia and completed her specialist ophthalmology training in Melbourne and Perth. Dr. Wu undertook the Fred Hollows Foundation Fellowship with Lions Outback Vision, providing clinical and surgical ophthalmic care in rural and remote uh, Western Australia. She then pursued further advanced uh, subspecialty training at the world-renowned Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, United Kingdom. So thank you so much, Dr. Wu, um, for joining us today. Uh, we're very grateful to have you here. Um, I'll just let you share your screen and then we should hopefully be good to go. And here we go. Let me just share my screen. And Perfect. That looks great. Brilliant. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I'm speaking to you from Wajik Noongar country, and I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to their continuing culture and contributions. It's a great privilege for me to talk about such an important topic and one that makes up a lot of my clinical practice. I'm particularly passionate about empowering people through education about their health, especially the sort of complex multi-system diseases such as diabetes. Diabetes. We'll be talking today um, basically on sort of four major topics. Um, Associate Professor Peter Van Weigarden gave an eloquent talk recently on diabetic eye disease, which can be found on the MDFA YouTube channel. I'll be building on this and talking a little bit more in depth in the management options to obtain and maintain the best possible vision. I'll also touch briefly on access to remote and regional sort of rural eye care with a bit of a Western Australian flavour. So a quick refresh on eye anatomy. Um, the eye works very similarly to a camera. The lens here is almost equivalent in that it helps with focusing for near and far. Can I just check that people can see my um, pointer? Is that all right? Yes, we can see the pointer. Brilliant. And that while the film of the camera is the retina, the retina contains the photosensitive cells. That's the cells that capture the light energy and convert it into electrical impulses, which then can be transmitted to the brain for processing. And so it follows that the optic nerve is like the USB cable that connects the camera to the computer, which is like our brain. There's obviously a little bit more to vision than just the mechanics of a simple film camera, but essentially to achieve good vision, all the components must be working properly. When people think of vision loss in diabetes, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously diabetic eye disease. And in actual fact, though, diabetes affects almost all parts of the eye. So this is a relatively complicated looking picture, which is actually a simplified version of the eye conditions that are, that are associated with um, diabetes. This actually comes hot off the press from a research article that was published just last month. I won't be going into detail about everything in the picture, but I will, and I'll be focusing on the corneal and lens issues, as these are more common and have sort of specific eye implications in diabetes. Finally, diabetes is a risk factor for strokes, which can also have a significant impact on vision. Many people will be familiar with the different tests that an eye care provider will perform. So for diabetic eye disease, a visual acuity check here on the left, a measurement of the intraocular pressure, so just like we have blood pressure, there's eye pressure, either with a handheld device or the gold standard, which is done on the slit lamp here. And dilation for a full retinal check, that would be considered baseline. To the left here, so normal vision, so normal vision is considered 2020 or 66 in our metric system. And the legal driving limit for the most part is 612 or 20 on 40. 
tests such as the OCT or the optical coherence tomography. So the OCT is one of two things that have revolutionized eye care over the past 15 to 20 years. To the right, we have an example of a normal OCT of the macula. The macula is the part of the eye that sees the clearest vision. You can see that there are nice layers and a valley in the middle. This is an example of a patient with diabetic macular edema. And you can see the layers are disrupted and the valley has become a bit of a hill. There are lots of other machines that we use to do different things, like take photographs, we check the visual field, and also measure the eye for cataract surgery. And in general, they involve placing the chin onto a chin rest, looking at a particular point and bright flashes of light. Fluorescein angiography is a very specialized test and that involves injection of a contrast dye into the vein, which then travels to the eye. And photographs are then taken at regular intervals, which highlights the stru eye structure. So you can see here with the progression of time, the blood, the contrast going through the blood vessels of the eye. And this is actually a picture from the title page, which demonstrates severe diabetic diabetic eye disease. Now, fluorescein is an important part of the investigations for eye disease, but it is an intervention and there are a few things to be aware of. Everyone gets a bit of a yellow tint to the skin, to the tears and to the urine for the next sort of one to two days. So it it's kind of looks like a bit of a bad, bad fake tan. So it's probably not ideal to do that just before a wedding or a photo shoot. There are some adverse effects. Most people tolerate it with absolutely no problems, but nausea and hot flushes, they're temporary, they come and go. They're probably the most common things that can happen. You can get a severe allergic reaction, anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis is life-threatening, but the risk of death is actually very low. So it's in the region of you know, under one in 200,000. So what is diabetic eye disease? Um, diabetic eye disease encompasses three major things. You've got diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, and diabetic macular ischemia. And in fact, when, when most people don't notice any visual problems when they have a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, but the changes are occurring in the background. And that's why it's important to get a baseline examination at diagnosis and to go for regular eye checks. The idea is to avoid sight-threatening complications, such as macular edema and macular ischemia and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Macular ischemia in particular is irreversible. In the eye, diabetes affects the small blood vessels, and blood vessels are basically the plumbing that carries the oxygen and other things to and from organs. So the damage to the pipes can lead them to being narrow. And if they're narrow, they lead to blockages. And if they're blocked, they lead to a decrease in oxygen, which leads to ischemia. And the ischemia is what then leads to the retinopathy and obviously the macular ischemia. The blood vessel wall, the damage to the blood vessel wall also means that they're leaking. So you can see here fluid is leaking out as our blood. And the fluid leaking out leads to diabetic macular edema, and the blood leads to the retinopathy again. The body responds to ischemia by trying to deliver more oxygen to these areas. And the signal for this is the vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF for short. This stimulates the growth of new blood vessels, and that then becomes this proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But these are abnormal blood vessels and they can bleed, which leads to a vitreous hemorrhage and they can distort the architecture of the eyes, leading to a retinal detachment. And obviously these ones here are sight threatening. And so what can be done? So these are the various management options that we have available to us. Obviously, the first one is observation or rather no intervention. And it's always an option across all of medicine, even though it may not be the ideal or the recommended option. Injections, whether there are anti-VEGF or steroid, laser therapy, and surgery. 
And obviously it's very important to look after the systemic health. So this underpins everything. So good blood sugar control, good blood pressure and cholesterol control and watching the weight. I will be focusing a little bit on anti-VEGF because it is one, it is the second of the two things that have revolutionized ICAM. And it's been an absolute game changer. It's become the first line treatment for many conditions, including diabetic eye disease. It's used as first line for diabetic macular edema with vision loss. It's also used in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is the neovascularization. Neo meaning new and vascularization, obviously referring to the blood vessels. It's relatively new as a monotherapy for this, this, um, this sort of complication. Anti-VEGF injections can also slow the progression of diabetic retinopathy in sort of research trials, but this is sort of to be weighed up against the absolute benefit, which in practice is not very much, versus the treatment burden and the risk of treatment. And the risk of the treatment burden can be significant. The medication works very well in most people, but you need ongoing and repeated treatments are usually necessary. It's usually done in the rooms and it's anaesthetized, so whether that's just with drops or a little tiny injection, and it's done with a sterile technique, obviously, to minimize any risk of infection. The expected treatment course for most people is about eight to nine injections in the first year. This does rapidly decrease after the first year to about a total of 19 injections over the, over sort of the five years. Some people do require treatment every four weeks, but the idea is to extend the interval between treatments as long as possible while maintaining good vision. And um, there are criteria for ceasing withholding treatment. So it's not like once you've started on this, you'll be forever on injection treatment. And these often include, you know, good stable vision and no fluid at the back of the eye. And it does have good outcomes. So by two years, more than half to, you know, um, three quarters of patients will have improved the vision by two lines. So on that vision chart, um, Oh, sorry, on the vision chart. So you could have improved from poor vision and it may improve to driving level vision. So things to expect with injections, so the intravitreal injections. After the procedure, it can be blurry, red, and mildly irritated. So this often lasts, maybe some, for some people it only lasts a few hours, for some people it lasts a few days. Generally, we don't give any medicated or antibiotic drops afterwards, but topical lubricants, so just moisturizing drops, can help with the irritated red sort of symptoms. Obviously, we will always have to watch out for pain, worsening vision, red or swollen, red and swollen eyelids, because they can be a sign of infection. We want to catch that as early as possible. Sometimes things like um, you have to watch out for floaters and scotomas to make sure there's been no other damage such as to the retina. It's actually very important to tell your eye doctor about any recent strokes, heart attacks and angina because in the larger studies there's this um, thought, there's this signal about whether it could be associated with strokes or heart attacks. It's a difficult thing to tease out in the trials, given that diabetes itself and age is an independent risk factor for strokes and heart attacks. The other injection and implants that we give for diabetic eye disease are steroid. And it's a procedure very similar to the anti-VEGF injections. It's considered second line therapy because the visual acuity gains are not quite as good as the anti-VEGF injections. It does last a bit longer, which does mean that you require less injections or implants and therefore less visits. It is a requirement by the PBS that um, you have to have cataract surgery. And it can work well in those with macular edema that doesn't really respond to anti-VEGF. And the reason why people, um, we are required to have had, the patients are required to have a cataract surgery is because um, the steroids in or around the eye is associated with the development of cataract. It's also associated with glaucoma or raised intraocular pressure. 
And specifically, the implant can migrate. And this is a very pretty picture of a patient who has had lots of laser therapy. And you can see a little implant there. And this implant does dissolve. So it dissolves away over the course of, from about eight weeks onwards, and it dissolves away to nothing. So there are lots of different lasers in, in eye care. So people know a lot about LASIK, so for, to correct short or long-sighted. This is slightly different. So there are two places in general where we put laser for diabetic eye disease. There is the macula, which is that central part of the vision. And then there's more peripheral, and that's called pan-retinal photocoagulation. Pan meaning everything, and retinal meaning the retina. Once again, you will be anesthetized. There's a little contact lens. So this is the little gray thing that sits on top of the eye, different to a contact lens that people wear for short or long-sighted. And you often see green and yellow flashes, lots of them. Macular laser is together with steroid therapy. It's considered second line these days because the visual acuity gains are not as good as anti-VEGF. And we still do use it, but much less frequently than we did a few decades ago. So in particular for, for people who it would be unsafe to give anti-VEGF injections who are not keen on injections in general, and specifically for macular edema, so fluid at the back of the eye that is away from the center because laser at the end of the day does destroy tissue, okay? So we don't want to be giving a little laser scar in the center of the vision. Pan-retinal photocoagulation basically is um, creating, basically taking away that ischemic drive. We, I spoke earlier about how if there's ischemia, there's this drive, this signal production of VEGF. And what the laser does is that it tries to take that away. And you take it away by getting rid of the ischemic tissue to try and preserve the site in the middle. So if done over one to four sessions and top ups may be necessary depending on how the eye travels. And moving on, surgery. So surgery can be done in particular vitrectomy. I'll talk about cataract surgery in a, in a few um, later on. So surgery, this vitrectomy is basically removal of the jelly in the back of the eye. So this is a picture of the eye. The jelly is the vitreous that sits in the back. And you have vitreous hemorrhage that doesn't clear away by itself, then we could go in and clear it away surgically. Or if there's concerns about other pathology, because vitreous hemorrhage, blood in the eye, can be due to a lot of different things. Obviously, if it's a retinal detachment, particularly if it's sight threatening, then we would go in to fix that. And it's often combined with laser therapy and intravitreal injections at the same time. So going back to that original slide about vision loss and diabetes, um, we're going to talk a little bit now about dry eye and diabetes. So dry eye is very, very common in the community in patients with and without diabetes. And you can often experience things like blurred vision, sensitivity to light, a gritty foreign body sensation, itch, tearing, red eyes, and so it's very common in diabetes, so in patients with diabetes, the prevalence can be up to a third of patients. And it is more common in women, perhaps related to estrogen, um, increases with age and increases when the HbA1c is higher. So that is with poorer sugar control, the, di the, eye, the dry eye can be worse. And if it's very severe, it can actually lead to permanent vision impairment because there can be scarring and there can be sort of infections and things. And the surface of the eye is usually, surface of the eye has a tear film and we require the tear film to get the best possible vision. When the eye dries out, it leaves almost like little potholes. And you can see that if a ray of light were to come in, having a sort of pothole kind of effect on the surface of the eye is going to scatter the light more than you've got a nice lubricated, well lubricated surface. So the mainstay of treatment is topical lubricants and improving the environment. So anything that dries your clothes is going to dry your eyes. So the wind, the sun, things like that. Um, other things that can that we recommend, I recommend, are using sunglasses to increase the humidity. 
Using spectacles as opposed to contact lenses, because contact lenses do dry the eye and irritate the eyes anyway. And taking breaks from close-up work or even just sort of visual tasks. So for reading, if you're on the iPad a lot or watching TV, when we do that, we concentrate. And when we're concentrating, we tend not to blink. And if you don't, and what happens when that hurt, when you don't blink is that the eyes dry out because we require the blinking action to spread the tear film across the eye and lubricate the eye. In terms of topical lubricants, these are often just bought over the counter. They come in multi-dose bottles and they also come in little tubes which are preservative free. We have no brand affiliations. We don't mind which brand you use. People find certain brands work better. The only caveat that we have generally is that if you're using more than six times a day, so that's every two to three hours, use a preservative free version just because we don't want the preservatives to be building up in the eye. So the more specialized treatment for dry eye include sort of medicated drops such as steroid and cyclosporin. You can also use autologous serum drops. That's basically where they take some blood, spin it down, and then you can use that, the serum as eye drops. This, this is only really available generally through a hospital system, punctal plug. So the tear film, we can put a little plug in to stop the tears from basically going away. Okay, just like a sink and a plug. Um, so like a kitchen sink and you plug it to keep the fluid in and therapeutic contact lenses. This is always sort of more advanced, um, more advanced techniques and treatments. And moving on to cataracts now. So, in, di in diabetic, in, um, in, with diabetes, there's about two to four times the incidence of diabetes. So basically patients with diabetes are more likely to get cataracts. And cataracts are relatively common in the community. It's one of the biggest causes of vision impairment. The risk factors include duration of diabetes and relatively poor sugar control. I've got here in the brackets, sort of the other risk factors, obviously things that we can't necessarily change. So things like age, increasing age, smoking, ultraviolet exposure, steroid use and ocular inflammation are all risk factors for cataract, um, cataract development. And not all cataracts require surgery. So there are some considerations. Um, it can always be observed. So, um, there's observation for early cataracts and whether the spectacles can improve vision. But when we're talking about timing of surgery, when we talk about surgery, a lot of it is to do with timing. So it is important to consider. And the timing of cataract surgery, these are the, the decision to undertake cataract surgery. It's obviously tailored to each patient and it involves a discussion with your eye surgeon. The principles are generally pretty consistent, and that includes consideration of whether the vision loss is due to the cataract, whether it impacts on activities of daily living, so cooking, cleaning, self-care, but also the legal driving limit. Is the vision correctable with glasses? Does the cataract impede ongoing ophthalmic care? So, uh, so, you know, making sure that the diabetic retinopathy wasn't getting any worse or to make sure there is or isn't diabetic macular edema. And then the presence of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and the presence of diabetic macular edema as what we would like to do is generally to optimize the outcomes is to treat the proliferative diabetic retinopathy and the diabetic macular edema first, if able, as Doing cataract surgery can worsen diabetic retinopathy and it can worsen diabetic macular edema. And also there are, so there's in general, the risks are a little bit higher than in patients without diabetes. It doesn't stop us from doing from cataract surgery and it certainly is a very good option because it can improve vision and it can improve view for further treatment and monitoring but it does need to be carefully considered so down there I have a, I have some sort of takeaway messages for cataract surgery so it can improve vision but timing is important and we really want to optimize the blood sugar level and diabetic eye disease before surgery a very quick um, note on glaucoma and diabetes. Glaucoma refers to a problem of the optic nerve. Okay, so that's the cable that connects the eye to the brain and um, often related to raised intraocular pressure. 
Now in diabetes, it's about 3%, okay? So three in a three, about three patients in 100. There is a 30%, 36% increased risk. So it is more common in patients with diabetes. And one of the risk factors is higher blood sugar control, blood sugar level. And you can see that's pretty consistent throughout all the eye conditions. That refers specifically to one of the more common types of glaucoma known as primary open angle glaucoma, what people consider as chronic glaucoma. Patients with diabetes are also at risk of something called neovascular glaucoma. That's the picture down the bottom. So you can see here in the picture, there's a lovely picture of an eye that has probably had drops in. And you can see these new blood vessels, these big thick blood vessels on the iris. And these are not normal blood vessels, okay? This has become the neovascularization or proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So neovascular glaucoma, when you've got new blood vessels here, this can result in the architecture of the eyes changing, leading to basically really high pressures in the eyes due to these new blood vessels. And that can be very tricky to manage, can cause vision loss and pain as well. The other eye conditions, these are just some pretty pictures, that was the glaucoma, but also occlusion, so blockages of both the vein and the artery. So to the right, to the, um, to the left here, we have a picture of a vein occlusion, which has lots of blood vessels, lots of hemorrhages. Over to the right is an artery occlusion, and it looks pale because there is no blood flow. It's completely blocked. So there's no blood flow, and so it becomes pale because everything becomes a bit swollen. These pictures here are basically due to cranial nerve palsies. So cranial nerve palsies occur when the nerves of the eye that control the movement in the eye have a little stroke. And so once again, diabetes is a risk factor for stroke, and that can result in a cranial nerve stroke and leading to it not functioning properly. And you can see here how the eye is turned in, and also here how the eye is turned out with a little bit of a droopy lid. Down here, right down the bottom, is a swollen nerve because there's been a little stroke of the blood vessel, of the nerve that supplies the eye. And then in stroke, so proper stroke, proper in the head stroke. So diabetes does increase the risk of stroke by one and a half to two times, and it does have implications for driving. So to the left here is normal vision. And this is say the left eye and the right eye. And you can test this yourself by covering each eye separately. When you have a stroke, what can happen is that you can lose the visual fields half of the visual fields or sometimes a quarter of the visual fields in each eye okay so basically covering up one eye can't see so well this side cover the other eye can't see so well so that's different to having a stroke in the eye or problem just in one eye where this eye one eye stays completely normal and the other eye has vision loss the implication for driving so if there's a trans ischemic attack or TIA, generally there's a, from the stroke point of view, there's a two week moratorium on driving. And for a established stroke, it's four weeks. However, if there is vision loss like this, often the vision does not fulfill the requirement for to get a, um, a driving license. So really the message here is that these are sort of the take home messages is that to get regular eye treatment. I know it sounds all doom and gloom, um, but a lot of these things can be managed and can be picked up early, but it is important to go for regular eye checks and treatment as required. Good blood pressure, blood sugar and cholesterol control, and then lifestyle changes such as avoiding smoking, diet and loss of weight. So good diet and loss of weight. So switching tangents just a little bit, rural remote access, in particular with such with in Australia, it's, it's incredibly important. And these days we are moving a lot towards teleophthalmology. And I think with this whole um, coronavirus pandemic, actually there's been a lot of focus on teleophthalmology and telehealth in general. So it's been actually very good for that. So teleophthalmology, here we have a picture. This is just taken from the Lions Outback Vision Introduction to Teleophthalmology video. And you can see here, this is a slit lamp and you can use 
a they can use a phone attached to the slit lamp to take pictures and ophthalmology is actually very picture based. We often require um, scans of the back of the eye and you can see here that with a machine like this you can take a picture of the back of the eye plus the scan, the OCT scan, and that helps a lot. And there's a lot of diabetic retinopathy screening clinics around rurally. There's also local and visiting optometry services and also visiting ophthalmology services. So while they may not be there all the time, they do go and visit. There's also the PATS scheme, which is the patient assisted travel scheme where the government helps with the travel costs. I've worked quite a bit with the Lions Outback Vision. It is based in Western Australia. Um, and this is the vision van, which travels all over Australia, um, all over WA. And basically on the van itself, it carries essential testing equipment, including a lot of the fancy machines, slit lamps, and even a procedure room. So injections can be done on the van. There's a hub in Broome that's now newly opened, just new opened um, over the last few months. So now up here in the Kimberleys, there are fortnightly visits from the ophthalmologist who is based in Broome, but the van itself then also does a loop. So thank you very much. I'll leave you with um, a slide where you can find further information. Please feel free to send through any questions and I'll do my best to answer them. And I'll hand back to Delini at um, MTFA now. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that, Dr. Rude. That was extremely um, informative and definitely learned a lot from that. Thank you very much. Um, I might just quickly uh, share my screen before we move on. So uh, just a reminder for everybody, um, if you would like to ask any questions or if you have any questions, you can definitely do that by selecting the Q&A um, icon there. When you select that, a white box will appear. You can type your question in at the bottom and uh, you can tick send anonymously if you'd like to do so before selecting send. Um, before we uh, go into the questions, I would like to touch quickly um, on the work of the Macular Disease Foundation Australia. Uh, we have a goal to try to reduce the incidence and impact of macular disease, and we try and do this through our four pillars. Um, our first pillar being prevention and early detection. So we provide current um, and ongoing information to try and increase the awareness of macular diseases. Uh, just last year, we reached over 7,000 people, which we were really proud of, and we're hoping to do the same this year as well. Support, oh, sorry, support and services. So we provide support for the entire macular um, disease community, and we also facilitate access to other support services too. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, third, the voice of the macular disease community. So it's our privilege to try to advocate on behalf of the macular disease community, whether it be designing policies for say state and federal government or making sure that medical benefits are not cut. And finally, research and data. So uh, since 2011, we've donated a massive $4.1 million to 21 different research projects, uh, all with the hope of trying to find um, a cure for all the macular diseases out there. Now, this is how we can support you. Uh, so the number that you see on your screen there, which is 1-800-111-709, uh, that's not just a number that you call when uh, you might have some uh, tech issues with webinars. That's actually our toll-free national helpline. So if you have any questions, say not just about diabetic eye disease, but perhaps age-related macular degeneration or maybe government services like Medicare or NDIS or My Age Care, we can uh, try to provide you the answers for all those questions that you might have. Uh, if you prefer to email us instead, you can do that by emailing education at mdfoundation.com.au. Um, if not, you can also pop on our website, which has a whole host of information. Uh, and that website it is www.mdfoundation.com.au. Now, at the end of this webinar, you'll, you will be receiving an email with a few different links in there. Uh, so the first link will be to a survey. Um, so this survey doesn't take very long to complete, but just gives us a little bit of feedback 
on today's webinar and you can tell us how we can improve or you can tell us what you enjoyed about the webinar. There will also be a link to previous webinars which we have recorded and you can watch in your own time um, and there may also be a link to future webinars as well. Now, uh, there will also be an option in the survey for you to receive any further resources that you'd like to do so. Um, for this webinar, we have reducing the risk of diabetic eye disease and the living with diabetic eye disease booklet. So if you would like any of those, uh, just make sure you select that in the survey. All right, so um, Dr. Wee, we might get to uh, some of the questions that have been asked. Um, alrighty, so the first question I have here is, can steroid injections be used in macular diseases? Sure. So yes, it can. It depends on which macular disease. So the common ones that people think about, such as macular degeneration, it's not used in macular degeneration. There's been no real big effect. And anti-VEGF injections, such as ILE and Lucentis, are by far and away the best option for macular age-related macular degeneration. Other things that affect the macula, such as a retinal vein occlusion um, and diabetic macular edema, as well as inflammation in the eyes that causes macular edema, so fluid there, yes, certainly it can be. Sometimes they use their second line because they're not, the gains are not quite as good as anti-VEGF, but yes, they can, certainly can be used for it. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we have is, uh, I have diabetes, but I have not been diagnosed with diabetic eye disease. Uh, should I be seeing an optometrist or an ophthalmologist? Um, and how often uh, should I be seeing them? Sure. So I would first go to an optometrist. They're very good and there's, you know, it can be easier access as well, but they are a very important part of our, the eye care community. They then can refer you on to ophthalmologists if there's some specific concerns or if there's anything sight-threatening that needs to be looked at. But optometrists definitely is a great way to go. How often? So definitely a baseline. So when you first get diagnosed and then generally it's about every year or two yearly, depending on what the eye looks like. If there's no diabetic retinopathy, we generally say touch base again in a year's time and then take it from there. Perfect. Um, this one says, if I have cataract surgery, can the implant affect the new lens in my eye? Generally not. So the implant sits behind the new lens. Very occasionally it does migrate to the front of the eye, but that's in sort of more specific, if you have specific sort of risk factors for it, but we wouldn't expect that the implant would affect the lens, new lens. Um, the next one says, uh, do they use your own blood in the autologist? I don't know if I said that right. Sorry, <laughs> That's right, drops. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why it requires, it requires special processing. So they do take, get some blood taken off, they spin it down and they take the serum and they make it into little dose bottles. And they, these dose bottles only last a certain amount of time. And then they, you have to go back to get, the, get more serum drops. They do work very well, but it's a much more involved process rather than popping to your local pharmacy to get, um, to get some, you know, some drops. Yeah. drops. <laughs> Um, and I think this is the last question that we have for today, which is, um, it says, thanks for a great presentation, Dr. Wu. It was very clear and easy to understand. Um, can the lion's van do injections and what sort of testing equipment do they have? Okay, thanks for the feedback. Um, so yes, they can do injections. Um, they carry, we carry sort of the ILEA Lucentis injections on board. And um, in terms of the testing equipment, so they have the OCT, they have, you know, vision testing. So the vision, the slow acuity chart, they can test the intraocular pressure and dilate on board as well. Um, now we can do OCT scans, which is the important thing, and also measure up for cataract surgery. So they've got all the fancy equipment there. They also have a slit lamp. So they can sit the patient on and have a good look in the eye, front and back of the eye. Okay. 
as well. That sounds extremely comprehensive. It is. Mm. It's re- it's a really great service. Mm. And they've done a lot of good work delivering care to the regional and remote um, remote areas. Mm, definitely. Uh, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Ruth, for, for the presentation and also for going through um, those questions as well. Um, I think we all found that very, very fascinating. And um, I, for one, definitely learned a lot. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thank you, everyone uh, who attended as well. I hope you all learned a lot. And hopefully we shall see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you.